Good afternoon again. I suggest that we start the round table. And I'm going to give the floor to André Benaim, who will moderate our round table, The Many Ways of Proust, Adaptations, Translations and Reception. André Benaim is a professor of French literature at Princeton University and a Proust scholar, author of Visage de Proust and editor of The Strange Mr. Proust. Particularly interested in questions of identity and representation, André Benaim focuses on the relationship between canonical literature and popular culture. He is currently working on an essay entitled Marcel Proust Superstar <laughs> on the presence of Proust in American visual culture, cinema and TV. Together with Mary Zimmerman, Lydia Davis, who's joining us on Zoom, and Ruben Gallo, they will discuss Proust's lasting influence in the arts and society. The discussion should last around 45 minutes with 15 minutes of Q&A at the end. Enjoy the round table. Thank you. Thank you. No. This one works. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Judith. Thank you to everyone at uh, Villa Albertine. It's a wonderful pleasure to be uh, with you uh, here today. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce our uh, guests, uh, starting with uh, Lydia Davis, who is an American short story writer, novelist, essayist, and translator. Her collections of fictions, including The Thirteenth Woman and Other Stories, uh, published in 1976, and Break It, Break it Down in uh, 1986, which was a, a finalist for the Penn Hemingway Award, have encountered uh, tremendous uh, success. Collections of short stories uh, include Varieties of Disturbance, a finalist for the National Book Award in 2007, and Can't and Want in 2013. Lydia Davis won the International Man Booker Prize Award in 2013, and in 2020, the Penn Malamud Award for Excellence in the Short Story. Her latest work includes The Collected Stories of Lydia Davis, published in 2001, 2009, which contains all of her fiction up to 2008, and more recently, collections of essays published by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux in 2019 and 2021. Davis has translated a number of French authors into English. Blanchot, Foucault, Michel Butor, Michel Deris, Pierre Jean Jouve, and most notably, Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert in 2010, and of course, Swan's Way by Marcel Proust in 2004. Please join me in welcoming Lydia Davis. Lydia, it's a pleasure to see you in so many ways um, through that, the lens of the camera that's looking at me on this screen on my side, in the reflection uh, of the window uh, at the um, other end of the room. Welcome. Uh, and we said that we, you, you may start by saying a few words about your work on the translation, the new translation of uh, Marcel Proust's uh, Swan's Way, um, and after which we could um, maybe go into a, a conversation, the two of us. Um, yes, can you, can you hear me? Very well, thank you, yes. Okay, I can't hear anyone in the audience, I can hear you with the, with the microphone. But the audience for me is clapping silently, which is interesting. <laughs> um, I wanted to say a few words, actually a little bit, a little bit more than just introduction, um, because I thought I would talk a little bit about the problems of uh, translating Proust. Um, I came to translate uh, Swan's Way because. Um, 
because of the Penguin Project to do a group translation. Uh, I was asked back in, in 1997 uh, or 96, so quite a while ago. And um, a lot of people have, have said, well, how can you have different translators for all the books? And that, that's sort of a legitimate question. Um, they made that decision because any one translator might die before translating the whole thing, which had happened a few times already. Um, so you, we take it for what it is um, and hope that Proust sort of shines through all the, the different uh, voices of translators. Um, I, at the time I was asked, I was, I was uh, trying to finish Michel Lévis's um, autobiographical work, the, uh, the, suddenly I can't, I can't, I think I was working on Fibrille, Fibrils uh, at the time. I had done two volumes, I was trying to finish the last. And translating Léris was a very good practice for, for translating Proust because Léris was also constructing very complex sentences in which you had to be sure you knew where the main subject and the main verb were, and that you could construct the same sort of complex sentence. I did not believe in uh, breaking up the sentences to make them easier to read, as I did not when I came to work on Proust. So I interrupted Léris to translate a little Proust for a, a sample, as we all had to do before being really accepted into the project. And then I went back to Léris, but did not finish at the time because the Proust was beginning and it was very demanding. So the, the Léris actually waited 18 years before, before I finished it. I did finish it. So... Um, I wanted to talk a bit, just give a few examples of the kinds of sentences that uh, I, I, I was working with in the, in the Proust translation. Um, it, not all translators take the same approach of not uh, changing the structure of a sentence more than necessary. Um, other, tr other translators, even within that Penguin project, gave themselves the liberty to break up the sentence or begin it differently and it differently put in different sorts of punctuation. I delighted in trying to match Proust's, even his punctuation as far as I could, given the difference in languages. Uh, and I found sort of two thirds of the way through, it suddenly occurred to me I didn't need as many commas as, as I'd been putting in instinctively that when Proust uh, skipped the commas that he might have had, I could try doing the same thing. But um, one of the most, and I should say uh, two other things about how I approached it. One was I, I did not read the whole book first. Um, and when I had originally read it many years ago in my 20s, I had never finished it. Um, and that, that's usually not because I lose interest in a book, but simply because something else comes along and takes over. So I had never finished it. I knew how far I'd gotten. I didn't read it again uh, because I wanted to approach it very freshly. I didn't want to know what happened exactly on the next page. And um, another thing I don't, do and didn't do was read a great deal about the book before I started. I had not been studying Proust. I'd been writing my own stories or translating other things. So I was not a scholar of Proust and I didn't really become one for this. Um, and again, for the same reason, I wanted to be very fresh, just, just me and the text. Whatever the text yielded, to me was what I was interested in, the way I saw it with my own eyes. Now, part way through, since I was trying to stay so close, um, I did look at Jean Mie's book about Proust. Now, I can't remember the title, of course. M-I-L-L-Y is his last name. Um, 
the syntax of Proust sentences or Proust syntax, something very straightforward like that. And he revealed what what Proust was doing, you know, whatever I hadn't seen already, he revealed further. And um, that made me even more sensitive to what was going on. He talked about pairs of... of um, pairs of clauses or triplets of clauses and how he would boost a balance, two sets of pairs, two sets of triplets, doing very complex things with the construction of the paragraph and this, the, particularly the sentence. And, um, and I believe not doing it in any mechanical way, but doing it instinctively to, to a large extent. Uh, I could be wrong, but I don't think he could write the quantity and the quality that he did if he'd been sort of deliberating a great deal mechanically over each sentence. I think it came out pretty much that way. Another thing he revealed was how a sentence would grow from the inside. In other words, you'd have the sort of basic sentence structure, main the, the, the subject and the verb, main verb, main subject. But within it, he would expand either with, with prepositional phrases or with dependent clauses. He would expand from inside the sentence, which was fascinating. So I wanted to, I wanted to read a few examples, which are kind of fun. And I must say, speaking of fun, that I did enjoy this this work. It was, a, it was a big, big project for me and a very painstaking one, but I did enjoy it. So I think I'll start with um, a sentence about Sagnette, who's attending at dinner at the Ville du Reims. Um, it's a single sentence. It's three and a half lines. And I think I'll just read it first in English, and then pick it apart a little bit. Sanyet, who, after hurriedly giving the butler his plate, which was still full, had plunged back into a meditative silence, emerged from it at last to tell them with a smile the story of a dinner he had attended with the Duc de la Trémouille, at which it turned out that the Duc did not know Georges Saint was the pseudonym of a woman. <laughs> now, what's interesting is, is this, um, well, that's the other, another aspect of these complex sentences, is what I call a Russian doll construction. So um, a clause within a clause within a clause often. So here you, he starts the, the, okay, the main, the main sentence really is son yet emerged to tell them the story. That's sort of the bare bones of, of, the, of the sentence, the main, the main structure of it, the main, the core of it, or the heart of it. Then he's, but he only, son yet, comma, he already stops the main sentence right away after the word son yet, son yet, and then starts a dependent clause, who, comma, son yet, who. Then he stops that one. <laughs> and says, after hurriedly giving the butler his plate. Then he doesn't go back to even that clause. He adds on another subordinate clause, plate, which was still full. Then he goes, then he completes that subordinate, had, who had plunged in, back into a meditative silence. And then he comes to the main sentence, emerged. So uh, it's, I guess it's hard for you to hear this, but um, that son yet who after which, then you know he's delaying us from getting to the core of the sense emerged. Another one which was a really uh, took me disproportionately long to translate occurs in a passage. Um, this is about Swan in the back alley outside Odette's window. I won't try to recreate the whole scene, but it starts with two very short sentences. 
or actually three. And the thing is that Proust was not monotonously building long, complex sentences. He was punctuating them with short, sharp sentences. He raised himself on his tiptoes, period. He knocked, period. They had not heard, he knocked again more loudly, the conversation stopped. And here comes the tricky sentence. A man's voice, which he tried to distinguish from among the voices of those of Odette's friends whom he knew, asked, who's there? So there again, the, the bare bones of the, or the main part of the sentence is, a man's voice asked. Um, this one I wanted to read in French because it's even better in French, of course. <laughs> Une voix d'homme dont il chercha à distinguer aucun de ceux des amis d'Odette qu'il connaissait, elle pouvait appartenir, demanda qui est là. <laughs> so you see how he piles up the verbs um, at the end. Qu'il connaissait, elle pouvait appartenir, demanda. <laughs> and I tried to do that in English, but I, I couldn't do it neatly. I, I, I created, for my own amusement, a literal translation. So you can do it literally, which you would never actually print in a book. A man's voice concerning which he sought to distinguish to which of those of the friends of Odette whom he knew it might belong asked, who's there? <laughs> That sounds like the way I write in English. <laughs> well, it's perfectly correct, and it's uh, extremely close to the French, but unfortunately, you can't really do that. I'm, I'm going to um, read one last longer example, and uh, this, this one is about the, the great aunt, the aunt. Um, And it brings up several interesting questions. Um, one is, is back to this syntax, this complex syntax, which is so fascinating. And actually the, the, the whole question of where is the main verb and where is the subject, the main subject, led me to, at the time I was also teaching, it led me to try to find out if my writing students even knew what, if they could even find the main subject and the main verb of a sentence, not like Proust's sentence, but just a fairly, a reasonably complex sentence. And they had great trouble. They really couldn't do that very well. So that was a bit of a revelation that one had to start over again and teach, teach writing students where the main subject was. <laughs> so this one, um, the main subject doesn't come right away. I'll read the, the paragraph first. And of course I loved, I loved reading and translating about the, the aunt. She truly loved us She would have taken pleasure in mourning us. <laughs> Had it come at a moment when she felt well and was not in a sweat. The news that the house was being consumed by a fire in which all of us had perished already and which would soon leave not a single stone of the walls standing, but from which she would have ample time to escape without hurrying, so long as she got out of bed right away, must often have lingered among her hopes, since it combined with the secondary advantages of allowing her to savor all her tenderness for us in an extended grief and to be the cause of stupefaction in the village as she led the funeral procession, courageous and stricken, dying on her feet, that other much more precious advantage of forcing her at the right moment with no time to lose, no possibility of an enervating hesitation to go and spend the summer on her pretty farm, Mirougrin, where there was a waterfall. 
and look how he just takes, <laughs> and I think that's, you know, that's, that's how he, I think, kept expanding the novel as he expanded not only in length, but he expanded from within. He could not, um, he could not sacrifice the, the, the ideas that came to him about ex expansion, um, being the cause of stupefaction, courageous and stricken, dying on her feet. Um, he, he gets deeply into it and lets it grow from inside. Um, so it's interesting to see, for one thing, I like the sort of anticlimactic Mirougrin where there was a waterfall. That's, that's really quite anticlimactic. Um, I, I like it for that reason. Um, so it starts, she truly loved us, comma. She would have taken pleasure in mourning us. And there's a great debate if you're a translator, you know, I don't understand how he's connecting those. Uh, it's, it's, will she take more pleasure in mourning because she loved us? Or is there a but there? She truly loved us, but she would have taken pleasure in mourning us. But Proust does not, not uh, really um, get explicit there. So my, my method was simply to um, mirror his construction and let the two clauses stand side by side with that comma that is not totally clear. Then there's a semicolon. So he has this little introductory thing. He doesn't often do that. Then he has a subordinate, had it come at a moment when she felt well and was not in a sweat. Then she, then he has the main subject, the news. Um, so uh, I think that's, that's about all I wanted to say about that, that long sentence, but that's by no means the only long and complex sentence like that. Um, and there's a great beauty to that. There is, Lydia, and we're only a week after Thanksgiving, am I right? Or only a few days? No, a week. And I wanted to not only tell you the admiration I have for the translation that you did, but to thank you for it, because you can really hear uh, Proust's prose and re respiration in these uh, and prosody in uh, in these um, uh, trans translated sentences in, in English. I don't know how you did it, did it but I, I want to, to thank you. I always say that. I always thought that Proust invented jazz before jazz was invented. Um, he he reads more like um, a free jazz a musician than a classical. I know classical music is so important in his uh, in his life, but that's because he didn't know jazz, uh, because he was creating it. Um, and we can hear it in your translation. I want to thank you very much. We'll come back to you with questions um, at the at the end of the roundtable. Uh, but thank you so much. Thank you, Lydia. It is now my pleasure to introduce you uh, to Mary Zimmerman, or introduce Mary Zimmerman to you. To introduce Mary Zimmerman, and say goodbye to Lydia Davis for now. Uh, Mary Zimmerman is a playwright and director of theater uh, and opera based in Chicago. She is the 1998 recipient of a MacArthur Fellowship the 2002 Tony Award and OB for Best Director for her play Metamorphoses, adapted from Ovid, and many other awards. She is a member of Looking Glass Theatre Company in Chicago, an artistic associate of the Goodman Theatre and the Jaharis Family Foundation, endowed chair of performance studies at Northwestern University. Mary specializes in the adaptation of classic texts for the stage, such as The Steadfast Tin Soldier, Treasure Island, The Jungle Book, Argon Argonautica, Candide, The Notebooks of Leonardo da Vinci, Arabian Nights, Journey to, Journey to the West, I really want to see that, Metamorphoses, Eleven and 
something we're going to talk about today, 11 rooms of Proust. And also uh, more recently, I think, Galileo Galilei, an opera with Philip Glass. She has twice directed for Shakespeare in the Park, just around the corner, and for the Metropolitan Opera, she has directed Lucia di Lammermoor, also at La Scala in Milan, Armida, La Sonambula, Rusalka, and Eurydice, among others, <laughs> uh, which is a new opera uh, based on uh, Sarah Rule's play. Please join me in welcoming Mary Zimmerman. Is this on? Yes, it is. Okay, so I've, um, uh, my mother read Remembers of Things Past, as it was then called, uh, when she was 18 years old during the summer. So I decided to do the same thing, but it took me four years. <laughs> and I've read it ever since. I've taught it, and I've sort of adapted it twice. I don't think you can adapt Proust for the stage in any kind of direct way. You have to come at it in a fractured or slant way. So my graduate recital, my PhD graduate recital was me um, having taken Celeste Albert, I'm uh, sorry, yes, Celeste Albert, his um, housekeeper's biography she wrote when he was, she was 84, in which she revealed that he would come home from parties and sort of tell stories and recount, which was great news to someone interested in orality and in the theater, that he actually acted out all the parts and took all the voices. So I combined sections of that with sections of, um, sections from all seven volumes, actually. But then later I came, my obsession would not cease, and I came to do a thing called Eleven Rooms of Proust. And the first time I did it, oh, well, I taught a course for two quarters, and they read, I assigned six of the seven volumes, and we read those knowing that they would then feel compelled over the summer to read the seventh. And by the way, for those of you still working your way through, the last 150 pages are a miracle. Like, it just opens in the most beautiful way. So keep at it if you haven't, though you probably all have. So I took my students, and I took their, we'd been doing little performances, and we rented, we rented out this house, and really what it was is vignettes throughout the house in different locations. Um, two years later, I did it more professionally, uh, combining a couple theater companies, but also students. Uh, how it worked was that audiences came in, it was site specific, so it was in an old warehouse, a factory that was on the market, but we knew even if it sold, it would take a while to close, so it was ours for a couple months. And um, audiences would come in, audiences numbered 30, and they came in every 20 minutes, and they were guided through the house, it was highly controlled. And we used these found spaces, and basically we followed the love story of Swan and Odette, which elides into the love story of the narrator and Albertine. Um, it was extremely popular, strange, <laughs> and financially impossible, uh, because only 180 people could see it a night. And we finally had to close because it became summer in Chicago. It was too hot to perform it in that place, and it, was, it hemorrhages money if you pay anyone. But I'm going to show you um, some pictures from it, just and take you through some of the, some of the rooms. Uh, it was made very organically. Normally when I stage something, I'm in a rehearsal room, I stage something really pretty, the lighting designer comes and watches it, we go on stage, he lights it really prettily. In this case, every night I had my scenic and lighting designer with me, and my lighting designer would light the architecture of this abandoned old warehouse, and we would stage in and out of the shadows and in and out of the architecture. It was idyllic and utopian and thrilling. Um, there was a double cast. The main characters had to be double cast. The rest of them were running, running, running between three floors of this thing to, you know, get back into scene one, go up to do scene whatever, come back into scene five, whatever it was. Um, it, very, very difficult. So uh, the titles, I'm going to skip that, titles of the scenes. Well, I was going to say the three reasons that you can't really adapt Proust straight is, first of all, it's just an atlas of the interior, right? So there's very little. And then when people do talk, they tend to talk for 300 pages and tell you the place name, origins of things. So it has almost no dramatic action has been observed. And yet great things happen, but as you know, they happen very slowly. And then also, the reason we love Proust isn't because of the plot, I don't think. Uh, it's because, as Celeste Albert recounts in her biography, 
She was, oh, Monsieur Proust, you can't say that. She, he, she was responding to him, the brothel scene with Baron de Charlus, and he was narrating, you know, all of these pr proclivities of this guy. She's like, you cannot say that, it'll be the ruin of you. You cannot, you cannot say that, Monsieur Proust. And he said, Celeste, if you know how to say things, you can say anything. <laughs> and Marcel Proust knows how to say things. That's what he said to her, and it is true. And so what we love in when we read is those sentences. It's the spectacular, technical perfection of their form married to the truthfulness of what they're saying and the astuteness of the observation. But that's all the narrative, right? That's not dramatic action. That's not people in dialogue. So, um, I, you know, a lot of times when I work, I sort of preserve the narrative. The names of the 11 rooms, if there actually are 11, I've never really counted, I just have to make it up. By the way, <laughs> the alternate title <laughs> was, this was the alternate title, and other than 11 Rooms of Proust, it was called, um, that was the time when I still believed that love really did exist outside ourselves. That was the other title. Um, and we always just referred to it as Proust House. Downstairs was his bedroom waiting for the goodnight kiss, then the Salon of the Verderans, you're looking at that. How did Swan fall in love? Another of you doing a, I can't pronounce it, Catalia, Catalia, the flower. Catalia. How do you say it? Catalia. There you go. Um, or first kiss. On the stairs was a section called Jealousy and Suspicion. Upstairs, the red room longing for death. The corridor, the solitaires. On the bridge, Albertina sleep like the sea in a room with a skylight, the painter in the field. The attic was photography and kissing. The ante room was the traveler departs from love. And the final room was um, uh, Swan's dream, where he's walking with Napoleon and Odette. Um, so I'm just gonna take you through one little sequence of those. Of those. I only am throwing this in here because the audience has just witnessed something done in a loading dock with one of those rolling metal doors. They're very interested in that. Then they're told by a tape in French and in English, like a, like a lesson, like an English, a French lesson, to turn and they see this. And you know, they're all 22 years old. We had no money for costumes. But I wanted to show this because that curtain pulled aside. There was a real piano in the room and someone was playing that swan on the left and Odette in the red dress. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm only showing it because people afterwards say, would say like, oh, that dining room, I mean, the wallpaper and all the chandeliers and the carpets and how they were dressed and the beauty of the gold, and it's none of that is there. <laughs> they were imposing it. You can see the ducts and the conduit work and the awful cement floor, all of it, but they overlaid it with what they were hearing, right? So go to the next slide, please. This is my favorite room. So this was a small room. And in this room, which was not painted red when we came around it, nor did it have the benches, had that strange metal thing in it to this day, I don't know what it was, with a kind of hollowed thing in the back of it. And I decided to make this a passage, basically I just took my favorite passages, about Swan's obsession with Odette. And we were having a production meeting in a pizza place in Hyde Park. And in that place, it was a tradition to carve on the benches, graffiti. And I got the idea, let's cover, let's paint it red, and let's cover the walls with the, just the word Odette. And we went in and we would write whole paragraphs with punctuation, but only the word Odette. It's written on the conduit pipe. It's written on the string of the light bulb. It's written on the benches. It's written on the floor. It's large, it's small, but it's, the entire world is only made up of, of one word. And then there was a narrator. When you come in, it's actually quite dark and you don't perceive that writing or the room very much. And then the narrator who ducked out of the night that we were taking photos, um, <laughs> was standing under that light bulb. And we had put a fluorescent light in that box and then the thing on the wall through the hole in the box in a store next door to this warehouse, it's a bunch of butterflies pinned to the back of a piece of cardboard. And the action during this, I'm gonna read the passage a little bit, is that the actor keeps trying to get comfortable on that stool. He stands up from it, he moves the stool a couple feet to the right, he sits down, can't get comfortable, repeats. Even when he could not discover where Odette had gone when she left him, it would have sufficed him to alleviate the anguish which he then felt and for which her presence, the joy of being with her, was the sole cure. 
a cure which in the long run served to aggravate the disease, but at least brought temporary relief to his sufferings. It would suffice him if only Odette had allowed it to remain in her house while she was out. And I think here he picked up the little stool and he moved it two feet and sat down again. Uh, to, to his bit suffice, if Odette would have allowed it to remain in her house while she was out, to wait for her there until the hour for return, but she would not. Then he picks up the chair. He had to return home. He forced himself on the way to form various plans, ceased to think of Odette. He even succeeded while he undressed in turning over some quite happy ideas in his mind. And it was with, and it was with a light heart, buoyed with the anticipation of going to some, see some favorite work of art the next day, that he got into bed and then he lay down on the floor of the box and turned out the light. But no sooner in preparing himself for sleep did he relax the self-control of which he was not even conscious, so habitual it had become, that an icy shudder convulsed him and he began to sob. And here he shuddered and that figure under the box, which we'll talk about in a minute, shuddered as well. He did not even wish to know why, but wiped his eyes and said to himself with a smile, and here the actor said, this is delightful, I'm getting neurotic. <laughs> After which he felt a profound lassitude at the thought that, and here he gets up and picks up the stool and moves it a couple feet, the next day he must begin afresh his attempts to find out what Odette had been doing, must use all his influence to contrive to see her. This compulsion to an activity without respite, without variety, without results, was so cruel a scourge that one day, noticing a swelling on his stomach, and he sort of felt his stomach, he felt genuinely happy at the thought that he need no longer concern himself with anything further, that his malady was now going to govern his life to make a plaything of him until the not distant end. And then this is a killer, killer Proust sentence. And if indeed at this period, it often happened that without admitting it to himself, he longed for death. It was in order to escape not so much from the intensity of his sufferings as from the monotony of the struggle. <laughs> I mean, any of us who have hopelessly wanted or loved something or been obsessed by something, the monotony of the struggle. Um, just a word about the figure underneath. So I did this show called Metamorphoses, which had Eros and Psyche in it, and that was Eros. Um, and I just felt inspired to throw Eros <laughs> under that box. And it was a private thing for myself. I felt very differently about love when I made the Proust house than when I made Metamorphoses. That's the same wings and the same gold arrow that we used in the production of Metamorphoses, but we made them filthy and we broke the arrow. <laughs> and so to me, it's an image of, you know, that dark alley that love can lead you down and the degradation, hopelessness and not goodness of that, of that side of it. So that was the Red Room. After the Red Room, uh, they went outside. You can do the next slide. And this is, um, I almost hesitate to do this room because it was so visceral and visual and fast and physical. But this corridor was maybe 80 feet long. And go to the next slide briefly, and then back to this one. That gives you a sense, and then go back to the original. So the audience is staring down this long corridor, and this sort of whispering group of people come up. And this is a passage, I love Proust's writings about inverts, gay people who are closeted from the world and even possibly to themselves. And this is a passage about that. So they all came running up towards the audience, and then they kind of fall away, leaving two men. I'm gonna read parts of this. Again, I hesitate to even share this because what kept happening was like long runs and walks away from the audience, 80 feet, and then runs toward us, the meeting of the men, the parting, a little action, a bride rushing in from the outside, jumping into the arms of one of the men, twirling, going out, someone mis uh, in it kind of magically placing a milk bottle. So if you can <laughs> fill that in while I read a little bit about that. Um, I'm, I'm going to do some edits in this, but let us simply say a word about those whom we began to speak of just now, the solitaires. Supposing their vice to be more exceptional than it is, 
They have retired into solitude from the day on which they discovered it, after having carried it within themselves for a long time without knowing it, longer, that is, than certain others. I'm making a cut here, blah, blah, blah. But when the day has dawned on which they have discovered themselves to be incapable at once of lying to others and of lying to themselves, they go away to live in the country, shunning the society of their own kind, whom they believe to be few in number, uh, I'm going to skip the rest of that sentence because I can't figure it out. Never having arrived at true maturity, plunged in a constant melancholy, from time to time on a moonless Sunday evening, they go for a solitary walk. And he's saying they, but he means one, this type of person. They go for a solitary walk as far as the cross crossroads where, although not a word has been said, there has come to meet them one of their boyhood friends who has been living in a house in the neighborhood and they begin again the pastimes of long ago on the grass in the night without exchanging a word. During the week, they meet in their respective houses, talk of this and that without any allusion to what has occurred between them, exactly as though they had done nothing and would not do anything again, save that now in their relations, there is a trace of coldness, of irony, of irritability and rancor, and sometimes of hatred. The neighbor sets out, so now the one man starts running away from us very far, walking, striding, sets out on a strenuous expedition on horseback, scales mountain peaks, sleeps in the snow. His friend, who identifies his own vice with a weakness of constitution, a timid stay-at-home life, assumes that vice can no longer exist in his emancipated friend so many thousands of feet above sea level. <laughs> and sure enough, the other takes a wife, bride ones into his arms. Seeing the beauty of the young bride and the demonstrative affection of the husband, he feels ashamed. Then go to the next slide. Yet the forsaken one is not cured. He insists upon going down himself every morning to the kitchen to receive the milk from the hands of the dairyman's boy. And on evenings, when desire is too strong for him, he will go out of his way to set a drunken man, drunkard on the right road or to adjust the dress of a blind man. No doubt the life of certain inverts appears to change. Their vice, as it is called, is no longer apparent in their habits, but nothing is ever lost. A missing jewel always turns up again. The married neighbor of our recluse has returned, and one night after dinner, the young couple, from which the bride, already in an interesting condition, has departed early. Our recluse finds himself at the crossroads, thrown down on the grass without a word by the mountaineer, who is shortly to become a father, and their meanings again begin again and continue. And he concludes, the feud of the Capulets and Montagues it was as nothing compared to the obstacles of every sort which must be surmounted by such men. Obstacles engender love. As soon as I consider these encounters from that point of view, everything about them is infused with beauty. <laughs> um, so you can see why these are my favorites. So we deliberately then led the audience through a very big abandoned room. Like we made it look really junky, like don't look at this room, there's nothing in this room, we're just going through this room. Don't look, it's nothing. And then we shoved them into this bridge between two warehouse buildings and pulled down the roll top door. And they sat in these crappy benches we built that we tried to make look like we were always there. We had a real ticking clock and we had a woman asleep on the floor soaking wet. And then we did this long, beautiful six minute passage about Albertina's sleep when um, the narrator watches Albertine sleeping. One night a big water bug was crawling over her the entire time. <laughs> um, <laughs> And that happened like inches from the feet of the audience. But what they didn't know was on the other side of that roll, roll down door, the entire cast was transforming the room they had just passed through into a field of yellow flowers. We had these wooden slats and we, you know, wire and uh, paper, fabric, yellow flowers. We, you know, hundreds of them that were laid out. So when we rolled up that door, you can go to the next slide, they were suddenly transformed into a, a field of flowers. And this is a passage about Elstir, and that's the narrator in the foreground, and this is my last one. Um, when you do site-specific work, you're kind of inspired, or you should be, by the space. You don't conceive it separate from the space. 
this had a big skylight in it. So um, the narrator was saying about Elstir. Elstir the painter loved to give, and uh, yes, he's in the background. Elstir the painter loved to give, to give himself everything that he possessed, ideas, work, and the rest which he encountered for far less, he would have given gladly to anyone who understood him. But for lack of congenial company, he lived in, unso an, in an unsociable isolation, which fashionable people called pose and ill breeding, his neighbors called madness, his family called selfishness and pride. Then there's a long passage I'm gonna skip. Um, he, had gra he had gradually begun to live for himself, remote from society, to which he finally became indifferent. The practice of solitude had given him a love for it, as happens with every big thing which we have been begun by fearing, because we know it to be incompatible with smaller things which we also prize, and which it does not so much inevitably deprive us of as detach us from. Before we experience it, our whole preoccupation is to know to what extent we can reconcile it with certain pleasures which cease to be pleasures as soon as we've experienced it. The subject in that sentence is really difficult, but it means some big thing that we're attracted to, in this case, is art. Um, and then, go to the next slide. This woman approached, which was who was hidden. She was lying down on this sort of catwalk up there, and she walked along it and reached down to him. This is Elstir, the artist. And the narrator said, ideas are like goddesses who appear only to the solitary mortal in the society of his friends, no man has ever beheld them. Um, it reminds me, I just did this thing called Notebooks of Leonardo da Vinci, which is an old show of mine, and Leonardo in his notebooks writes that you can't be, you have to choose solitude, because if you choose companionship, you will serve badly the duty of companionship, and even worse, trying to follow your, follow your conceptions in art, because you can only pay attention to one thing at a time. I misquoted that badly. Anyway, so that's a little taste of the 11 minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. Well, this was absolutely um, extraordinary, and I hope that, I, I know it's been a lot of work, but I hope that we can see it someday uh, in real. Putting this together has really made me want to do it again, but it's just economically, it's so difficult. <laughs> well, let's start raising funds tonight. Get your wallets out. <laughs> you have a, a Venmo, you accept Venmo. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll find a way. Okay. Our next speaker and last speaker of the um, round table is uh, Ruben Gallo. He is the Walter S. Carpenter Jr. Professor of in, in Latin American Studies and Literature at Princeton University. Hello. Where he has taught since 2002. He is the author of many books on 20th century culture, including Mexican Modernity, The Avant-Garde, and The Cultural Revolution, published by the MIT Press in 2006, and winner of the MLA's uh, Catherine Singer Kobach's Prize. Freud's Mexico, Into the Wilds of Psychoanalysis, also with MIT in 2010, and winner of the Gradiva Prize and Proust's Latin Americans at, uh, with the Johns Hopkins uh, University Press in 2014. He's also a novelist and was published and um, has published two books on Cuba, Teoria y Práctica de la Habana in uh, 2017 and Muerte en la Habana in 2021. His work has been translated into French, Spanish, Italian, Japanese, and Chinese, and he's a member of the board of the Freud Museum in Vienna. And in 2020, he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Please join me in welcoming Ruben Gayo. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, André, for this beautiful invitation. It's always a pleasure to talk about Proust. I can't think of anything that makes me happier than to hear the language of Proust, especially in the voice of Lydia Davis, uh, whose translation I use when I teach at Princeton. And it's such a beauty to discover Proust on the stage. I hadn't um, 
Um, I didn't know about this project, but it's beautiful. Con congratulations. Um, and thank you all for being here. So Andre asked me to talk um, about Proust and Latin America. And if we could go to the next slide um, and next one, please. So um, a few years ago, I published this book that's called Proust's Latin Americans. And something that interested me was that even in the world of Proust, which seems so rarefied and so French and so 19th century and so insular, it was actually full of Latin Americans. You know, it was a period in France in the late 19th century where there were many Latin American writers and poets and intellectuals, but also politicians, you know, a lot of dictators who had fallen out of favor in their countries and took refuge in France, including, for instance, Porfirio Diaz from Mexico, but many others. And one thing that no one had looked at was that basically in all of these salons and dinner parties and um, various balls that Marcel Proust went to, he was actually surrounded by really interesting and eccentric Latin Americans. So I studied a few of these in, in my book. I won't talk about all of them. You know, you can see the list uh, in there, but I'll give you two examples. And if we could go to the next one. Next slide, please. Um, so, of course, you know, the most famous Latin American in Proust's life is Reinaldo Hahn. And what's interesting about him is that very few people know that he was indeed a Latin American. He was born in Venezuela and arrived in Paris with his family when he was a child, about age three or four. So he grew up perfectly bilingual, bicultural, but always kept an attachment to Spanish and to Latin America. He was a musician, a composer, and he's very interesting to think about in relation to Proust. Um, you know, they met when they were very young. I think Proust was in his early 20s, 20 or 21. And um, so he, uh, Reinaldo was 21 and then Proust was a little bit older. He was maybe 23 or 24. But what's interesting is that there are very different models for how to be an, a successful artist. Um, Proust, and this is something that I've always been interested in, Proust was a failure for most of his life. He had many of his classmates from the Lycée Condorcet who began publishing when they were in their teens, in their 20s. And Proust was basically the neurotic friend who never published. He was just saying he was working on this great novel, but no one ever saw anything about it, you know, and for years and years and years. And Reinaldo Han was the opposite. He had his first success when he was 15. He composed, um, he set to music one of Victor Hugo's poems, Si mes verres avaient des ailes, and he began performing at age 15. Uh, by the time he was 26, he had premiered his first opera in Paris, and then Proust this whole time was basically just saying that he wanted to be a writer and had all these projects that never materialized. So he was a very interesting Latin American. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, one thing that really interested me in, in my book was the correspondence between Proust and Reinaldo. They, they were lovers, you know, when they met. Uh, this is actually the only documented relationship that we know of Proust, that we actually have the letters to prove it. And one thing that's interesting is that in all these letters that Proust wrote to Reinaldo Han, in many of them he drew. And you can see um, on the bottom left of the drawing, it's actually Reinaldo Han sitting at the piano in a salon, you know, which is what he would have done starting at age 15. So you can see an audience, you know, you can see the, the, the piano with the... Um, you know, with the in the long piano, and then you can see Reinaldo Han um, playing as well. The other thing that's interesting is that um, Proust played a lot on this idea of Reinaldo Han being exotic, you know, being somehow foreign, even though he spoke beautiful, accentless French, but. Part of the relationship was Proust loved to make fun of this. So he made all these funny names. He never called them Reinaldo. You can see over there, he called them Bunscht and he called them Gunscht. And basically in every letter, he made a different name. He called them Bunibuls and Bunchibuls and, um, and uh, Goodimels. And, um, and he also made a funny French when he wrote about him. It's almost like French with an accent, with a foreign accent. You know, he would change the spellings. He would introduce all sorts of uh, strange typographies and um, um, H's, you know, where they don't go. And my interpretation in the book was that he was playing on Reinaldo's foreignness and exoticism. Um, next slide, please. And... 
So in some of these drawings, what's interesting is you can see that he would take Reinaldo and he would decide to draw him. But Proust always, he had many layers to whatever he was writing or doing. So here he would actually trace these religious figures from a book that was very important to him, which was Émile Malle's La Religieux au XIIIe siècle, you know, which is his, one of his main sources about information of cathedrals, the building of French cathedrals. And as Proust was going through this book, uh, it was a book published in 1907, and it's one of the first books that included photographic reproductions of the art that was found inside these cathedrals. So Proust was very interested in tracing some of these statues and stained glass windows and other figures. And what you can see here is that he would then send them in the letters to Reinaldo and he would turn these religious figures into Reinaldo. So, you know, here you see a saint, um, you know, a prophet on the right. And then on the left, you see the saint has been turned into Reinaldo Han. And since he was an opera composer, he's holding a scroll with one of the titles of his opera. I think this one says Carmelite, La Carmelite. Um, next slide. Um, oh, and this is one of my fav favorite drawings that Proust um, sent. He called it Explication du Vitrail. So he basically designed a stained glass window like you would find in a cathedral, but it was the love story of Reinaldo and Marcel. And what's very funny is in the first, uh, in the first few little windows, you see a typical scene. So, you know, he's imagining that they live together and he's imagining that Marcel is always sickly and in bed and he can't get up. But Reinaldo is playing the piano and going about his life. And then in the last three or four windows, so Marcel dies, poor thing, he gets buried in a cemetery. And then the last, the very last frame is Reinaldo goes to visit his tomb and takes off his top hat to pay salutes to him. And he also had this very funny um, language, you know, where he talked about everything that was happening in the um, stained glass. So next one. Um, so another one, you know, the second one of Proust's Latin Americans that I will tell you about. Uh, this is probably my favorite character because he's the least known. So his name was Gabriel de Iturri. He was from Argentina. And unlike Reinaldo Han and most of the other Latin Americans in Paris, you know, most of them came from very wealthy families. You know, they had grown up speaking French, even in Latin America. When they arrived in France, there was absolutely no culture shock. Gabriel de Torre was different. He was born in the boondocks in Argentina, in a little town near Tucumán. It's not even a town. It's, um, you know, it's just a rancheria, you would call it, that's called Yerba Buena. And I actually went there once, you know, as I was doing research and I couldn't believe it. You know, it's just, I don't think you could find a more desolate, remote, um, it's really just a bunch of trees with a house or two. So he was born there and he had this dream, you know, he wanted to go to Paris and live in a chateau and, you know, don't we all? And <laughs> what's funny is, you know, he had absolutely nothing. He was from a poor family, he didn't really have any special training, but he was really smart and very cute, so that helps. And he ended up meeting this priest from England, actually an incredible character. One day I hope to write a book about him, Kenelm Vaughan, who would do these elaborate trips through South America in the 1860s. And he was an English Catholic priest, and he would actually collect funds to try to reconvert England to Catholicism. Um, and he actually raised a lot of money. And one of the things he would do to, to collect money is he would tell people, he would, he would meet with the most important families in Mexico, in Buenos Aires, in, in Bogota, and he would say, do you realize whenever there's a new king in England, they have to abjure the Pope, Rome, and the transubstantiation. And people were so shocked that they would take out their checkbook and <laughs> give him lots of money, but you know, unfortunately it didn't work. But he was the one that found... Gabriel de Tourret took him to Europe and he had his dream because he ended up, next slide please, he arrived in France penniless and he ended up becoming the boyfriend of Robert de Montesquieu, who, as you know, is the model of the Baron de Charlus. And he was one of the wealthiest aristocrats from one of the oldest families, one of the most snobbish men in Paris. 
And Iturri had his dream because he ended up living with him in, in all of these beautiful houses. And if we could have the next slide. And they became a famous couple. You know, everyone was obsessed with how they would dress the same. They would, they even looked the same. They were kind of dandies that were very interested in this mirror imaging uh, of each other. Next slide, please. And this is where Iturri ended up. This is the interior of Montesquieu's apartment um, on the Quai d'Orset. And by the way, this was the inspiration for Huisman in Orebourg Against the Grain. You know, if you remember that very obsessive novel about this interior that is almost nightmarish because it's so packed with things, you know, and everything in that space just has a, a very elaborate story. So this is where Iturri ended up. And actually, he began collaborating with Robert de Montesquieu, and he was, Proust became very interested in how Iturri's job was to scout for all of these antiques, for all these special things that um, Montesquieu became obsessed with. And I wanted to show you, there's a very funny quote. A lot of people went to Montesquieu's apartment, and everyone was a bit in shock just about the incredible amount of things that you could find in there. And there's a very funny quote by Léon Daudet, and if we could go to the next slide. And, you know, this is what he describes in the interior. There's a hair from Michelet's beard, a cigarette smoked by Madame Sand, a dry tear shed by Lamartine, <laughs> Madame de Montespan's bathtub, Bonaparte's chamber pot at Waterloo, Marshal Bougeot's cap, the bullet that killed Pushkin, a dance slipper worn by Laguccioli, Madame de Reynal's stocking with autograph by Stendhal, a tuberous nose taken from the death mass of Parmentier, etc. And part of what was so shocking to people who visited Montesquieu was that he would insist on telling you the story of all these things. So you were very quickly overwhelmed by the space and Iturri was his partner in crime when it came to that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I also wanted to tell you, well, there are a few more of Proust's Latin Americans, but André actually asked me to say a few words about how Proust was read in Latin America. And... There are a few stories I could tell you. You know, Proust became very important in Latin America. Um, you know, even I, I remember when I was in my 20s in Mexico, people would do Proustian dinners. You know, some of my friends who were writers, they would do these Proustian dinners and everyone would pretty much play at recreating this world. Next slide. But there, there's actually a really interesting, I'll just tell you about one example. Um, José Donoso, the writer from Chile, uh, who actually went to Princeton as an undergrad. And he's the reason that we have all of these Latin American archives at Princeton, like Mario Vargas Llosa's papers and Carlos Fuentes and many others. He's the reason we have them, because when he went to Princeton in the 50s, he left with student loans. And every time Princeton would try to collect, he would always say, I'm a writer, you know, I don't have money, but I have lots of papers. So finally, Princeton said, well, send us your papers. And that became the first archive. <laughs> Next slide. So Donoso wrote this really interesting book of novels in 1982 that's called Cuatro para Delfina, four short stories for Delfina. And one of the short stories is called El Tiempo Perdido, uh, Time Lost. And as you can see, it begins with a quote from Proust, next slide, uh, from Time Regained. And it says, what we, have not, what we have not had to decipher, to elucidate by our own efforts, what was clear before we looked at it, is not ours. And this is basically what sets him <coughs> into the novel. Next slide. And what, what's interesting about this short story is it's a short story that's set, set in Santiago de Cuba, in Sa Santiago de Chile in the 50s. And it's about a group of friends. Um, there is the narrator who is an aspiring writer and intellectual. And he has a group of friends who are a combination of people interested in literature, but also socialites and whatnot. And what's really interesting is each of them takes a name from Proust's novel. So there's a character called Oriane, like the Duchesse de Guermantes. There is an Odette, there is a Charlus, there is a Bazin, and they all live in Santiago, sort of <laughs> pretending they're in Proust's Paris and dreaming, you know, of this elaborate world and sort of replaying all of the 
all of the little intrigues that that happen in the novel. Now, what's interesting about the story is that eventually the narrator, you know, this young aspiring writer, he gets a scholarship from the sister institution of Albertine, from the Alliance Francaise, to study in Paris for a year. Um, and he's thrilled, you know, and all of these Proustian characters take him to the airport, you know, Oriane is there and, and Bazan and Odette and, and they see him and he's just, you know, for him it's ecstatic, you know, he's finally going to go live in Proust's world. And of course, the harsh reality is he arrives in Paris. He has to live in the Chambre de Bonne without heating. He never gets invited to a dinner party or to a party. And the only people he meets are other Latin American students <laughs> on their scholarship. So, you know, he spends these gray, depressed, sad months in Paris until he goes back. And then he finds out that that Proustian circle has dissolved. Um, you know, Odette has died. All the other people have gone on and done different things. Next slide. And um, next slide. And um, he ends up, you know, when people say, how was Paris? How was Paris? Tell us about Proustian Paris. Did you meet the real Odette? You know, did you meet the descendants of the Duchesse de Camon? He actually decides to not tell them, you know, and to try to let them imagine what would have been there. So I just wanted to end with this quote, you know, which is by Proust. Uh, which is that the only paradises we have are the ones we have lost. And I think Donoso understood this very well, and he has this very funny story, which I recommend. It's not read very often, but it's a beautiful story. And actually, if Lydia is hearing us, I don't think it has ever been translated, but I think um, it would be nice to have it in English. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ruben, for this uh, wonderful journey through the Latin Americans in Proust, around Proust. It was wonderful. I'm looking at the Time Master to see how long we have for questions. Yes. Five <laughs> we have 50 minutes for questions. <laughs> Sorry, yes, ma'am. Uh, oh, thanks. Uh, this question is for Lydia. While translating Proust, um, did you find instances where he, he messed up? <laughs> I think just, just one. Of course, I'm going to have trouble <clears throat> getting it exactly right myself, but that's certainly another um, question about translating that do you reproduce the mistake? Um, and say nothing. Um, and that's what I did. I had notes in the back. It had to do with, and someone here can probably correct me, but it had to do with the trip to Italy that the uh, Verdurins were planning. And it, at, one, in, at one moment, uh, four travelers were mentioned and the trip itself had three or vice versa. Um, that's, that was the actual little plot mistake um, he made. If anyone wants to get that exactly right, uh, they're, they're, they're welcome to. But for both that book and, um, and Madame Bovary, I had notes in the back. Uh, at the back of the book, no notes on the page and no marks on the page because I didn't want the reading to be interrupted in a sort of academic, scholarly way. I wanted it to be a live experience. But if you were puzzled, you could find the place in the back and read, um, read to solve the mysteries. There were mysteries in Flaubert, and there was that one mistake anyway in, in Proust. Thank you, Lydia. Um, this is also a question for Lydia. Um, I was wondering when you were translating Proust, um, were you often tempted or do you consider this to be a, a correct way to go about the translation to think about what he would have said if he would have said it in English and try to actually interpret it in a way that is more understandable to the English audience and then write that. Not to change his words, but, you know, make it 
more English. I, I don't, that's, yeah. <laughs> it's a hard question to ask because how, how would you make it? I mean, I, I found Proust very clear. Um, you know, the, the sentences are very complex, but his language is quite direct and straightforward. He's, he's not, um, that was my complaint about the Scott Moncrief translation was Scott Moncrief made it more flowery and more um, metaphorical and more repetitious than Proust actually was. He was quite clear, quite direct. Uh, if he used the word good, he might repeat the word good eight lines later. Um, it, it was plainer than the English translation. So I, I, no, I did not sort of think how would, how, what would his English be like now? I sort of tried to just transport myself, uh, I don't know, into his mind via the French and write it in close, you know, closely in English, in, in also quite plainly and straightforwardly. Um, Thank you. Um, this is probably an obvious question, but do you think that there was a semantic or a, you know, significance unintended or otherwise to that syntactical structure that you talked about so much? I don't think I understand the question of significance. Um, like a, a meaning, right? Or a more significance imparted to what he was saying in the sentences that was as a result of that syntax. Like when you, when you were citing that moment um, at the table, you know, um, that first sentence where key, comma, he did such and such and such, it's almost as though the meaning of what was being said was rhythmically forced us as readers to stop and experience what he was trying to convey, kind of, almost like. Yeah, I, I see what you mean. <clears throat> that the short, clear, clipped sentences, you know, come at us one way and the convoluted, they're not really convoluted, but complex sentences come, force us, yeah, in, in, into the greater and greater complexity <clears throat> of the thought itself. And to me, it just reflected his mind uh, always seeing more and more nuance of, of a situation um, and nuances of the nuance and that, that, that we follow him into that way of thinking and seeing. Thank you again, Lydia. And thank you for joining us uh, here. Uh, via Zoom, we were privileged to, to see you. We are we have the privilege of having uh, our other guests in person. So I encourage you to ask them your questions uh, in person um, when we are almost done uh, at uh, the outset of this uh, presentation. And I think that we have to move on uh, to uh, the next um, section or to the next uh, break. <laughs> <laughs>